Jay Guru Dave Myron. Jay Guru Dave Swami Rabbiti Kantananda. How are you doing? I'm doing good. So, welcome to my podcast. Happy to be here. But hopefully, the first of many episodes together. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, Myron is um, a long term friend of mine. We've been working together for a long time. He's a, he's a dentist by profession, Dr. G. Um, but also, I would say, very, very much involved in the fields of philosophy and, and um, thinking. And I'd say a very thinking and thoughtful person when it comes to this path and, and everything that comes with it. And that's why we've had so many conversations over the years, debates and exchanges, whatever else. And, and I think one of the things that actually drove me to even do this podcast was people often heard that we had these debates and we had these conversations and people were always like, oh, I wish I was a fly on the wall yeah. and I could listen in on these things. And I thought, well, all right, then let's do it on camera and then people can listen in. But hopefully this is going to be a bit more toned down. <laughs> We're going to shake hands by the end of it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you live in the UK. Yeah. That's an important little point there. Um, you're also an author, written two of my favorite books. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Avatars of the Master, Hypocrite Within. Um, another one on the way? Another one on the way. We'll, we'll talk more later. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, okay, so without further ado, I think we've got a lot to get through today. Yeah. We agreed to talk about the Sampradaya topic. And for those of you who don't know, Sampradayas, in very basic terms, are just um, disciplic successions, lineages, let's say, of Hindu thought, Vedic thought. Um, and they play a big role, let's say, in, in, in the landscape of Hinduism, especially Vaishnavism. Um, but it's also a controversial topic <clears throat> in the sense that um, the way people see them is very, very different, and therefore it has a very different let's say, effect on the various different lineages and groups and whatever else. And with with us and Bhakti Marga and with Guruji, because we started Sampradaya very recently, Bhakti Sampradaya, it's been a topic of just trying to wrap our heads around and trying to understand what the landscape is and why people think a certain way and why things are set up a certain way and, and whether it should be set up that way or not. And so lots to, to sort of pick at. Um, what do you think? Let's, let's maybe we can just start with this. What do you think is the the actual intent and purpose of a sampradaya? So you mentioned you have Sanadana Dharma, which is like it's almost like a jungle, right? Mm. It's just this kind of ecosystem of random spiritual ideas. And yes, you can bind it by certain principles like the Atman, Karma, Dharma, reincarnation, things like that. But fundamentally, it's it's a, it's a free fall. Right, it's it's all kinds of stuff going on, and sampradaya is an attempt to bring some orthodoxy, some consistency. So imagine you walk into a jungle, and then you see a kind of structured village, an oasis, but a structured village. It has its hospital, school, and so on. And you go to, and then that's one sampradaya. Then maybe you go to another place in the jungle, and you find another kind of small little village and city where where there's a civilization developing and communities and so on. So sampradaya creates that orthodoxy and it is also a way of creating consistency and most of all i probably would say a legacy right um a, a legacy of consistent teaching practice ritual a holy whole spiritual path i mean one of the one of the meanings of sampradaya is um that which gives fully right so it gives a whole path and so once you enter into a sampradaya through usually a process of initiation, you don't need anything else, right? You know, we always use the example of getting married. Once you're married, that's it. You don't go anywhere else. This is where it stops, as opposed to the kind of spiritual culture of Sanadana Dharma where you can pick and choose. I pick up this text one day, this inspires me, then I go to another place or another guru or another teaching. Um, so that's the reason why sampradaya is there, to give that consistency. Um, and yeah, you're right. Guruji has started the Hari Bhakta Sampradaya and, you know, suddenly a Sampradaya which should have thousands of years of history and tradition and commentaries and texts and acharyas and so many leelas and so many great personalities and we in the 21st century in Frankfurt, Germany have started a Sampradaya, right? So it sounds over the top. It sounds like it, it invites weird. criticism and it invites a lot Absolutely. of questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah, completely. I mean, we it is like a red flag, 
uh, to a ball for potentially other Sumpra Dyers who are steeped in tradition, consistency of great personalities. What right do you have to start a Sumpra Dyer is, is the question that's going to be asked. Yeah. And I think that's why I said from from that point on, there's a lot of interesting conclusions that we draw from this that are literally like, well, maybe you guys aren't as um, black and white as you thought you were about your conclusions and about your your sort of frameworks. Yeah, and I think some Pradaya, in my opinion, and I think we've we've obviously discussed this a lot, but in my opinion, it needs the that the veil needs to be pulled down, and we just need to start being honest with each other as devotees, as Hindus or as Vaishnavas who follow an orthodoxy or some Pradaya. We need to be honest about what it is and what it isn't, and and I think that will help once you understand that. The, the kind of prospect of starting a new sampradaya is not as, you know, outlandish as you might think. Um, I think I think that's the key thing to understand, like the myths that we need to under, they put forward. I fully agree. I mean, I think you you mentioned one of the meanings of sampradaya is that which gives fully. Another one is is that which connects to the source. And the reason I, I say that is because I think at its most simple form, a sampradaya is meant to just connect you to the source. Chapter 10, verse 8, Krishna says, I'm the source of everything, right? And yeah. so the idea is you're connecting to God and and the Sampradaya sometimes loses track, I think, of the actual purpose that it's supposed to have, which is, I'm here. It's it's a, yes, it's an orthodoxy. It's an orthopraxy as well. It, it's, it systematizes thought and practice into a sort of, as you said, civilized society of, of sorts within the landscape of Hinduism and Vaishnavism. But the, the only real purpose of it at the core is to take you to God, to connect you with God, right? If it's not doing that. Yeah, I mean, that's just, it's so fundamental, but it, you just you can easily, easily get lost in the world of Sampradaya, of Shastra, of chapter and verse, and this Acharya said this, and this Acharya said that, and everyone can just lose the focus. You are supposed to be connected to God, full stop. If it doesn't do that, then it's not serving you. And the thing, like, I mean, I've had dialogues, say, with a, with a Sri Vaishnava, um, and the thing that we were arguing about, well, not arguing, it was it was quite pleasant in the end. It was a very, very good discussion, actually. Um, and he was kind of making the point that, you know, the Sri Sampradaya is very ancient, you know, back to Nata Muni, um, Alvaz, back to Mahalakshmi, right, as tradition says. Um, and so it's a tried and tested method. You have Acharyas following consistently um, the, the teachings. And so it's it's withstood the test of time. Um, and therefore, we can trust the teachings and the practices, and therefore, it's kind of authoritative. And I, my response to that was, my mum makes sweet rice and Thai pongal, right? April 14th. It's, a, it's something that's been continued for centuries, for millennia, potentially. It doesn't mean it's truth, right? If we have a strong community that can carry something forward over and over and over again, it happens. If you want, if old is gold and ancient is the measure of legitimacy, well, why not go for Buddhism? Yeah. Yeah. Why not go for the Mimamsa philosophy? You know, yeah. why not? Why not even, okay, if Nata Muni is in a certain, you can go for, for Christianity is pretty ancient, right? Or Judaism. I mean, it, relatively speaking, even all the Vaishnava Sampradayas are pretty modern. I mean, even if we're talking about pretty much all of them forming in the last thousand years, and that might sound like a long time. But in the bigger picture of the religious landscape of the world, it's really not. It's, it's These are sort of very recent movements, if you want to call it that. No, but what happens is when people appear appeal to ancient authority, it's just assumed it's all true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Remember when um, Guruji, Guruji was initiated into the Sri Sampradaya, yeah. right? And so um, there was this kind of person who was saying, you know, how do we know he was initiated? Well... The devotee, you, you met his, uh, the Acharya who initiated it. Sure. You met him personally, right? Um, so we have pretty good evidence to show that he was initiated in the Sri Sampradaya. But no one questions whether, say, Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or some, or Madhvacharya. Any, any of them, yeah. Right. No one questions it. That's just assumed, right? Even though it happened thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, right? That is bona fide. That is authoritative. You can't question that. And if you question that, what are you doing here, right? You're completely misguided. So whereas I've, if I've met somebody, a personality, and you've met the actual Acharya, and you've met, you've gone with Guruji to the Acharya in the place where he was initiated, right? Can give you address and street if anyone needs. Yeah, address and street, the whole works. And yet, 
and you've, I've seen the photos as well. And, and yet we're supposed to somehow go, well, I'm not sure if he got initiated, but he definitely did get initiated, even though it was 500 years ago. Again, it's an example of how we're losing track of truth, right? We're losing track of truth. Tradition, it's a wonderful thing. I'm not, again, we have to always caveat everything we're saying, right? But that we're saying that, look, if you, if you have faith in that, it's not a problem. It's not like we're saying it's wrong, but we're just saying if you are, if the criticism is you are starting a new sampradaya, how is it authoritative? How is it legitimate? Right? Well, I would say that w- I would posit that we are potentially in the most legitimate position because we are currently with the founding acharya of the whole sampradaya of who we are placing our faith in. We are seeing him directly right? We are seeing his words and his actions and his personality directly. We're not relying on centuries old texts written 500 years ago, 600 years ago to depict a story or a leader that may or may not have happened. That is a real leap of faith. But the leap of faith we're, we're having with Guruji is minimal in comparison, negligible. I, I think just to give, to give some pradaya, it's due as well. There is a protective element, as you mentioned. It's tried and trusted. It's a formula. It's it's something that has survived for a long time. So even if it's not the truth, and I take your point, absolutely I do. But at the same time, when something does survive as long as these sampradayas have, it, it generally sort of speaks to its safety. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people, when they when they get into Hinduism, when they get into spirituality, there is this concern of cults, of gurus that are false, of just sort of fake teaching yeah and i think the sampradayas do serve a really important purpose in that sense of protecting yourself from that to some extent yeah but they we also have to acknowledge so i can understand the skepticism at the initial stages but but we also have to acknowledge all sampradayas would have started in this way uh i well that's that's for me one of the most fundamental points of this whole thing yeah it's it's recognizing how the the perception of a sampraday changes from its inception to the to the point where we're looking at it now a thousand years later and, and when you analyze the beginning of any of these sampradayas, especially some of the claims at the root of these sampradayas, it's um, it's fragile to say the least, right? Because we, we talk about uh, Madhvacharya, for example. Madhvacharya, one of, and we'll come to this maybe in a little bit, that there's this idea in the Vaishnava world that there are four bona fide sampradayas. Yeah. Not everybody holds this idea, but we'll come to that. But Madhvacharya is one of them in Madhva Sampradaya. And we're talking about 12th century, give or take. And... The situation with him is that he's initiated by Veda Vyas. Now, Veda Vyas is said to be an incarnation of the Lord. Veda Vyas is also said to be um, the scribe of the Mahabharat. Yeah. So we're talking about a personality that was uh, 5,000 years ago here on earth writing Shastra, and then also 800 years ago initiating Madhvacharya. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that didn't happen. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Yeah, but it requires a leap of faith. I'm saying it requires a, a pretty massive leap of faith. And where's the evidence for it? Where's the logical, let's say, coherence to it? Yeah. Even I'm not even saying evidence. Where does this make sense? Yeah, even? yeah. But it's never questioned. I haven't heard a single person openly put the question forward. Are we really just taking this at face value? And the reason that I think they don't is because most sampradayas have a similar claim at their point of origin, yeah. and so nobody wants to ruffle feathers yeah. because you're just going to have the same accusation aimed back well, at there, you. Well, there is a lot of they did it, so we can do it. Exactly. Um, and so it just, and this is what I'm saying: we're drifting away from the very purpose of sampradaya. Is do you know God? Yeah. Can you get God? You know, is God is Krishna being re- revealed to you now? Right? What realization? What transformation in consciousness is going on in you now? Right. And so what happens is you have the Sampradaya games. And these are these are kind of games of like philosophical games, which I understand when you have a, a movement, a tradition that you want to protect and somehow, you know, harmonize with other traditions and so on, you have to come up with these kind of explanations and you have to come up with stuff. And it's a bit spurious and it's a bit kind of like, you know, really? Um, but everyone kind of shrugs their shoulders and just moves on and and, and gets going. And it brings out, you know, Sham, one of our God brothers and uh, he, he, what was, I did an episode with him. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Fine. Um, he 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 just put it very bluntly. He goes, "The what makes a, a sampradaya authoritative is two things: time and numbers. Right? It's not like comment- like it's not commentaries on Brahma Sutras, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, like Prastana Treya. That's just a, like a nice little seal you put on there on your CV as a sampradaya, and you can just say, yeah, fine, we've got that. Right? But at the end of the day." People take you seriously with time and numbers. That's it. 
Right. Well, the, the idea of Prashtana Thrive is also just reactionary. It, it's Shankaracharya establishes his philosophy. The Vaishnavas don't agree and they refute it. And so they just, and I, and I respect and agree with Sri Ramanuja in this sense and the Sri Vaishnavas as a whole, they refuted Shankaracharya on the same grounds. Yeah. Right. So he commented on this, we'll do the same just to show yeah. that there's a different interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. So the currency of the time was Shastra, right? Yeah. And that's the thing we need to really, really understand. You're talking about, you know, whatever, 8th, 9th century and 11th century Ramanuja Acharya. The currency of the time, the, 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 the means of exchange of ideas, of legitimate ideas, has to take place within the realm of Shastra, right? And my, what I'm proposing is, in the 21st century, is the currency Shastra? And I would say bluntly no. Really. This, this, is, this is something that still takes place in bubbles, online yeah. <laughs> or in India, in pockets, in holy places in India. But by and large, it doesn't take place. We're in Frankfurt, Germany. If you go down the street and quote Upanishads to the guy on the, who's waiting for his train, he's not going to care, right? Um, it, no one, you go to a Christian, he's not going to care. Right? Go further than that. Go to, an, go to the average devotee of any of these sampradayas and quote them Upanishad, they're not going to care. Yeah. Even Hindus and even the yeah the Vaishnavas themselves don't yeah. even care, right? <laughs> because they care about you know the, how's the deity looking, you know, or something like oh what's this Leela from the Bhagavatam or something like that, you know, that the rasa that, chanting the next kirtan, doing the next puja. Yeah, um, and so we have to understand. Like, I, I'm more likely to dialogue and interact with a Muslim and Christian and atheist than I am a Vedantin. That's true, right? So. We have to look at where are we in a, in, a, in a globalized digital age in the 21st century? And where does Sampradaya fit in that context? A new Sampradaya, right? That wants to bring something new to the world, a new path, a new way of looking at things that builds on obviously existing ideas and traditions, right? But, but brings something innovative and new. How do we, how do we um, move forward with that kind of Sampradaya? And we have to reflect the contemporary times. We cannot pretend we're in the same Vedantic bubble of Ramanuja Acharya and Shankaracharya. Well, I, well, I fully agree, but I also think that, again, it, that there's so much is just codified as if this is now a, a law that cannot be broken, when really it's just copying someone else. We yeah. made the point earlier already. So Ramanuja refutes Shankaracharya on the, on the scriptures that he did just because he did it. And then it's like, that's now the, the divine law because that's really how they take most mostly sampradayas take all of these things as being divine law. This is this is divinely ordained that a sampraday must be set up in this way yeah. for it to be legitimized. And again, where is the evidence for this? It's just a historical observation. It's the, the moment, person X copied yeah. person Y. It's and the momentum the followed, of tradition. Yeah, yeah that's you're all absolutely it is. right. You're absolutely right. And I think it's not we're not we're not challenging this just to be edgy. And I yeah. think that needs to be made clear. Well, look, we, it's, we're it's calling, not about. Yeah. But just to, just to complete my point, I think we're calling this out because. There is, at least in my, uh, to, to, to my point of view in this, I think there is a very important need for people who have sort of rooted themselves in this way of thinking that because they've done it, we have to do it the same way mm. without asking the question, why did they do it? Yeah, it's, it's not, they did it, therefore we copy it. Why did they do it? And that's, I think, at the fundamental sort of basis of what we're doing here is challenging the whys. And then as we have done that, and this is not the first time we're having these conversations, yeah. obviously, interesting answers have come up. And some of them have been because it was relevant for that time and it no longer is, as yeah. you just pointed out. And others have been uh, because actually that is necessary and we're going to do the same thing. It's yeah. not that it's a blanket statement here that some products are all outdated and we need to completely revamp the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. But as you inquire sincerely into the setup of it, you, you start to come up with genuine answers that lead to, to genuine consequence in, in changing the way it's set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think... The idea of Siddhanta, right? I think we should, like, that's where the crux of it is. I mean, practice and rituals and so on, obviously very, very important. There's, you know, Agama Shastra and things like that that people follow. But the real crux of it is Siddhanta. What is your Siddhanta? What is a Siddhanta? Tell, so, tell people. So, so yes, Siddhanta is kind of like the, the philosophical conclusions of your sampradaya, right? What is, what is What do you have to say about your existence, about life, the goal, the path, the means, Right, um, and it, that Siddhanta, especially in the Vaishnava context, is always rooted in Shastra, because Shastra is seen as the highest pramana, right? Which is means pramana means the means of valid knowledge. So your Siddhanta, your philosophical conclusions, have to be grounded in the chapter and verse of Shastra. Um, and I think 
first of all, we need to understand what do we mean by Siddhanta, right? And si- we, I think we need to be really clear. Siddhanta doesn't, is not absolute truth in and of itself. Because like, just like Guruji was saying, the Shandilya Sutras, right? I'm just throwing words at the ultimate truth to get you to understand something of its nature, right? Yeah. So what is Siddhanta? Siddhanta is there as a lens to carve out our spiritual path in this reality so that we can reach that supreme source, right? It is a lens by which, which, which we can carve it out. So tattva, that means principle, affects bhava, the feeling, or rasa, the taste, right? So whatever you think, if you think that you are God, like Advaita Vedanta, if you think that I am Brahman, literally Brahman, right? That gives a certain rasa, right? If you think I'm just a servant, a tiny anu, and, and uh, the Lord is vibhu, all-pervasive, immovable, right? Infinite in his nature. And I'm just tiny in respect to him. That, and I'm just a das, a servant. Well, that gives a different rasa, a different bhava. So tattva affects bhava. So when you create a siddhanta, you are creating tattva, principles by which a rasa a bhava can be evoked and that is that rasa, that bhava is what takes you to the realization of God, right? Of the supreme source, of the divine. So that is what Siddhanta is doing. To pretend that Siddhanta is literally, accurately, precisely describing the entirety of the absolute truth is, to, is, is, is a profound source of delusion, and even it's arrogance, because it's this, it's a, it's this idea that Siddhanta can conquer God. Well, it, well, it's also incoherent because, as you as you said, the idea that Siddhanta is the ultimate truth it, it doesn't it cannot stand because there's multiple Siddhantas. Yeah, like each and they're, all, and they're all authoritative. But that, that's, the, that's that's the, yeah, that's the crux of what I want to get at. So most of these sampradayas, uh, let me if we speak specifically about the Gaudiya sampradaya, they're going to say, look, these are the four bona fide sampradayas. Point finished. But they're the last ones to arrive at the party so to speak, and then they've closed the door as they've walked in. They've basically said, we're participating in this bona fide situation. It's a cartel. And now we close the door, you can't get in, right? Yeah. And then they've said, okay, so these are all legitimate. All four of these are legitimate. Yeah. Yeah, no question. But they all have four different philosophies and four different conclusions. And sometimes... Radically different. Yeah. They, 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 they can't be like reconciled as just saying, oh, it's Bhava. It's just a different Bhava. One worships Krishna, one worships Narayana. That I can put down to Bhava. Like, you say, like, just give an example, like Madhvacharya yeah. and, and how the distinction of souls. Some souls are, are, are destined, predestined, for hell. predestined yeah. to go to hell. Yeah. And some souls are predestined to stay in this eternally. particular world eternally. And yeah. some are predestined to go to get, you know, be with Krishna, right? Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's not what... Other that's thing. not rasa. Yeah. That, that's not a way to relate to God. That's yeah. a factual statement about the nature of your soul. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and you can't reconcile these things. And at the same time, there is this just unspoken agreement that we're all going to say this is all okay, this is all bona fide. Yeah. We know that it's incoherent. We know it's illogical, but let's just not sort of poke holes at each other. And I think it's, it's, there's a good reason for that and a negative reason for that. The negative is because everyone just wants to hold on to their legitimacy. And so they're willing to, to sort of gloss over issues in yeah. the system. The positive of it is that there's just an open-minded sort of underpinning to Hinduism that yeah. is tolerant and does accept yeah, yeah. multiplicity of ideas. And I think that's a good thing. We can keep that and throw away the other side of it and say, no, let's actually have an open conversation. Because when we do, I think two of the things we find out is this, when we start to see that, wait, they can't all possibly be true at the same time. Yeah. Therefore, what's going on here? You arrive at a very obvious conclusion, which is what's going on here is that there have been some great acharyas or gurus who have their own perception and their own interpretation of reality, Shastra, everything else, their own experience. And they've mapped that out systematically. And people have decided to follow that on faith. On faith. They've looked at those persons and said, they're inspiring people, they're charismatic, they're convincing, the arguments sound logical to me, I'm going to follow that. Now, that's your right. Everyone can do that. But the minute you turn around and say, um, but therefore, this is the ultimate truth, right? Yeah. You are undermining the very system to which you are now proudly claiming to follow, which is the Sampradaya model, unless you're really claiming, and this is where it ends up being a sort of caricature of itself. Yes, there is a system called Sampradaya. Yes, there are four of them. But in truth, don't tell anyone, ours is the only true one. Yeah. yeah. The others are all wrong. But we won't say it in public. Yeah, yeah will politely sort of say that, you know, they're all, they're all legitimate. But if you ask me any single philosophical question or you pose to me any stance that any of the other three 
have, I'm going to say it's wrong. Yeah. Then what do you mean by saying it's bona fide? So when you sit there and say this is a legitimate sampradaya and it's bona fide, but then you disagree with every conclusion that it puts forward, yeah. what is left to be legitimate about it? It's just lip service. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's that's one of the things that I, I think we definitely need to to put out in the open and say, how do you reconcile that? So are they all legitimate? What is it that needs to give? So the way we would look at that is what Guruji just recently said uh, in one of the satsangs just during the, um, the festival and so on. He was basically saying um, that every Acharya comes to the Supreme Truth and gives their understanding, their Baba, their Rasa of that Supreme Truth and lays it down in Tattva, in principles of commentary of Prastana Tray or whatever text it is. Um, and then that follows and becomes a Siddhanta of their Sampradaya. And so what is actually happening here? We are commonly told that it's Shastra, Guru, and Sadhu, yeah, uh, yeah as the kind of um, three things. But really, it's Shastra is the ultimate authority because, you know, if you want to measure the Guru as being legitimate, you would go to Shastra and say, does he follow Shastra? First of all, what is Shastra? Which interpretation of Shastra? Let, let's just start with that. What is Shastra? Yeah. Okay. Um, Depends on the Sampradaya. Depends on the Sampradaya. <laughs> and it's just this funny thing, this word, it's so fascinating to me. It must follow Shastra. No, but it, 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 let's just, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but what a ridiculous situation, right? Where we're saying Sampradaya follows Shastra as authority. Yeah. And you go, well, what is Shastra? Depends on the Sampradaya. Right. <laughs> just there already. I, like, I am God because I say I am. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's a circular, circular argument. Argument. So. Shastra, well, let's just think, just think for people who might not fully understand where because we obviously we we talk a lot and people might not know. So shastra is seen as divine revelation, scripture, right? So you have some sampradayas that will say, oh, you know, the Upanishads, Veda, Shruti, you know, divine revelation. Um, that must be uh, the, the the ultimate authority. Sh Shaivites will say, well, our Shaiva Agama is our highest authority, even greater than the Vedas, right? So the Shakta traditions will also say that. Even though you have Vaishnava traditions who say, yeah, Shruti is the highest in theory, but the reality is the Puranas, Puranas. Are, are more explicit about what the supreme truth is. So we should go to the Puranas. And so what is happening here? People are choosing Shastra according to their, according to the Acharya, yeah. right? According to what the Acharya feels. So, we go back to what we just said. The Acharya is looking at the Supreme Truth and going, this is what Narayana, this is what Krishna looks like. This is what he is. And with that bhava, with that rasa, they are going to the, sh to the body of literature available, which is the Vedas, Puranas, and Mahabharata, and so on, Algamas, and so on. And they're saying, right, how does my bhava, how can I reconcile my bhava with these source texts? And so if you find a particular text, that is really, really nourishing your bhava as the Acharya, the founding Acharya of Sampradaya, you will find a logical, systematic way to just elevate that text and say, yeah, this text is the one. At the expense of other texts. Yeah, and the, well, the, those, these texts are great, but they're somehow incomplete, uh, but this is the one, right? And, you know, you have, obviously, Jiva Goswami does that in Tattva Sandarbha, um, lays down the kind of systematic thing of Shruti being incomplete and so on. And then you have the Puranas and of the Puranas, the Sattvic, Rajasik, Tamasik. And then of these Puranas, the Bhagavata is the highest. And that nourishes his Bhava, his Rasa that he's got from Mahaprabhu, right? And so that's how he lays out the Sandarbhas. You have Ramanuja Acharya who harmonizes the kind of very... He gives, he gives a skeletal form of Narayana from the Shruti, right? And then brings up the, we talked about the, the, the Divya Mangala Sharida, the divine form of Narayana comes from the Puranas and, the, and the, the, maybe the Pancharatra and also harmonizing that with the, the Alvas, the mystic saints, yeah. right? Um, and he's marrying all of that together. What does Shankaracharya do? Well, he says, well, no, Upanishad Mahavakyas, right? Tattvamasi, Aham Brahmasmi, he picks out these statements. So what is happening here? Right? You have Acharyas who have a whoever Bhava, who have a Rasa, and are then going to Shastra, right, which is this huge body of texts, and finding ways to justify why certain texts are more elevated than others so that they can nourish their own Rasa and Bhava and create a systematic philosophy for their Sampradaya to flourish, which is a legacy of their own teaching. Not only that, they often include the writings of the, the previous Acharyas as Shastra as well. Yes. So, for example, if you if you do take the Gaudiya Sampradaya and you take Jiva Goswami because you mentioned him and his Sandarbhas, they'll consider the Sandarbhas Shastra. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, whenever they're making an argument for why something is legitimate or illegitimate, they'll say, but look, Shastra says so. And then they'll quote Rupa Goswami or they'll yeah. quote Jiva Goswami. And sometimes they'll come to us and say, 
occasionally and say, you know, it says in Shastra, where's the Shastra? Oh, from, you know, from uh, Krishna Sandarabha. It's like, okay. So, <laughs> okay, so. These are just the life stories and the teachings of Acharyas within a certain tradition. But look, or, but look, if you subscribe to that sampradaya, fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. Fantastic. Look, amazing. That isn't the point we're making. The point we're making is not that these things are illegitimate, that, that these things are considered or elevated by the followers of that tradition. It should be, as we follow, as we elevate the, the, the teachings of our guru. The issue is that when this is presented as if it's universal Shastra, that this is a Shastra across sampradaya borders, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is nonsense. It's a nonsense. No Sri Vaishnava is sitting there in Sri Rangam at the moment studying yeah. Jiva Goswami's Sandarbhas. Yeah. And similarly, a Gaudiya Vaishnava, it's very unlikely that they're sitting there studying Deshika Satadushani, for example, and saying yeah. this is the ultimate truth here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they're contradictory at some point. No, and what is really happening here is that a Sampradaya is fundamentally about Guru Bhakti, right? If you really reduce everything down, and this is what we're talking about, lift the veil of Sampradaya, right? What is happening? You have the founding Acharya, let's say for Sri Vaishnavas is Natamuni, right? And Obviously, they would say, you know, it's founded by Mahalakshmi. Okay, fine. That's a faith base claim. No problem. It's, it's what tradition says. But Nathamuni, should we say, is the kind of, I would say, the original the Acharya who yeah. lays down the actual Siddhanta, begins to lay it down. He gets the Divya Prabhandam. He then, Yamanacharya follows. He further elucidates the Bhava, the Rasa, and the Siddhanta laid down by Nathamuni. Then what happens is the great Ramanuja Acharya comes and he explodes it in and really you know, cements it into the Shruti Shastra of the Vedas and so on. And so, you know, that's why he's considered so prominent, that he really establishes the legacy of the, of the Sampradaya. And, and then from then on, you have, you know, other Acharyas coming in, Desika and so on, Pillai Lokacharya and so on. And what do they do? They just keep going back to what Natamuni put in, that I'm a Das, I'm just Anu, I'm not what Shankaracharya proposed, right? And Vaikuntha is Nitya Kainkariyam, I'm eternal servitude, you know, and then Ramnuja expands and Yamanacharya expands the idea of property, right? This kind of, this saving grace of, of the Supreme Lord Narayana. And so from there it follows, the, the Acharyas have a bhava, and it may be that as time goes on in the Parampara chain, the Guru Disciple chain, it may be that the later Acharyas have, you know, great more insights and expand the philosophy. They don't deviate. It's not, you're not saying deviating, but certainly expanding and nourishing and giving more. But it's all in that chain of Parampara. So Parampara Sampradaya is a bhava chain. It's a rasa chain of the Acharyas. So therefore, when a person gets initiated into a Sampradaya, they are subscribing to the rasa and the bhava of the chain of the Acharyas. So, so let's make a, a claim, a, a little stop there, because in the Gita, Krishna mentions the idea of Parampara, chapter four, right? That he, he okay. gave teaching before, then with the passing of time, it becomes corrupt. And if there's, some people interpret, therefore, that Parampara is not a transfer of rasa and bhava, but rather just it's knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Because Krishna says, I taught this, I gave this teaching, right? I think it's too literal inter an interpretation of yeah, it. Yeah. I think you give the, the whole body, you give the whole sampradaya. And in a sampradaya, there's not just knowledge. There is, as you said, rasa and bhava and all of these things. And I think that it, it's, people need to wake up to that a little bit, which is, yes, Krishna is talking about paramparas being a model to follow, but he also says in the same chapter, chapter four, verse 34, that you should go to one who has seen the truth in order to acquire Tatva the truth. Darshana, yeah. yeah. And, and that is, is the marriage of the point we're making. Yes, there is a, a chain of teaching, but it's not an impersonal chain. You actually have to go to a specific person who has the direct perception of that truth, who can then give it to you. That's the system that he's actually put forward. Yeah. And, and that is where the rasa comes in because that individual is gonna have his rasa. And to say that all those individuals, everyone who has had tattva darshan is saying the same thing, is just false. It's yeah. objectively false. If you if you think they should be all saying the same thing, you cannot validate all four sampradayas at the same time. No, it's nonsense because they're not saying the same thing. So the the, the point sort of the buck ends there, which is, if you have to go to someone who's had tattva darshan, as Krishna says, yeah, and then from them you acquire the truth, but the truth that you acquire from these various great acharyas is actually different. Then are they seeing different truths? Or are they actually seeing the same truth, but interpreting it through their lens? Mm. And so what you're taking on is not the truth, but the lens of that person. And that's the claim we're making. Yeah. In every single instance, whether they want to admit it or not, in yeah. every single Sampradaya instance, they are the disciples and adherents of that Sampradaya are always inevitably 
taking on the, the the implicit bias, almost the lens, the the rasa, the bhava, if you want to be more polite about it, from each of these acharyas. But they believe and they'll go out and repeat and claim we are taking Shastra as it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Krishna in, in chapter 16, he, you know, it's often crazy. He says, you have to follow the Shastra, right? I would I would just qualify that a little bit and just by to explain that chapter 16 is about the Asra Sampad, right? The kind of like the demonic path, right? And he's labeling all these kind of extremely deviant things, you know, uh, of, what I, you know, I'm a sacrificer, you know, this kind of hedonistic mentality that he label, he puts down in chapter 16. And at the end, he says, you have to follow Shastra. And for th- Viveka, for discrimination yeah, of and what and to I do th- and what not to do. And I, I don't believe Krishna really means, like, every single chapter and verse. If you were to deviate from just a slightly, it is illegitimate. You are illegal, right? I don't think he's taking it to that extent because he talks about, as you just said, approach a bona fide, approach a master who has had tattva darshana, not yeah. just who knows stuff, right? Who's read some books, but who's actually perceived firsthand the darshan of Krishna, the supreme truth. Approach that person with, with humble servitude. That already limits. Yeah things a lot which is yeah. how many of those people are really walking around right okay i mean that's a huge other discussion but like right. is that who is who has actually seen krishna who can you say has actually seen krishna and, and forget about um can you prove it to other people ask yourself have you seen somebody who has seen krishna right that's the, that gets to the, the real heart, the beating heart of the whole situation. But that's why Krishna says that in chapter four. Later on, he says, follow the Shastra. And what is the Shastra? As you said, what the Tattva Darshan a person has said, has seen, right? What he has laid down. What does Shankaracharya in his Brahma Sutra commentary, he was talking, he says, what is Shastra? Why should we follow Shastra? Because it's the Aptavakya, right? It is the qualified personalities and their great statements. Yeah. That's why we should follow um, Shastra at all. Um, but but is it, without denying at all the, the the importance of shastra because obviously I I believe in that but I often find that in following shastra we're blind to some of the statements the shastra itself makes so the idea that shastra is some silver bullet that just gets everything right and if you follow it you're golden is is to me a bit nonsensical because shastra itself claims to have limits so for example in the Bhagavatam it says it lists various incarnations of the Lord yeah. right. And then it follows up by saying, but the Lord's incarnations are innumerable, meaning they're not all contained within this Shastra. Yeah, yeah. Just that very statement to me already says, okay, so Shastra as a, as a corpus points to true things, but it also omits many true things. There's also many true things outside of the body of Shastra. Yeah. It, it is literally implicitly stated in Shastra that that is the case. Yeah. And if that, that being the case, at the very, the very least, you have to have an attitude of humility towards it where you go, okay, this is good stuff. And therefore, the truth can be found here too. Absolutely, yeah. But it cannot be the the the, the be all and end all. This is not the only place where truth is found because it tells me it's not the only place yeah. where truth is found. Well, this is this is wonderful episode in the Mahabharata where um, Arjuna comes back where he's supposed to have killed Karna and he comes back to see if Yudhishthira is all right, right? And then Yudhishthira says, "Have you killed Karna?" And then uh, Arjuna says, "No, no, I came to see if you're all right." And he goes, "You idiot!" Basically, and he, goes, and, he and he insults his bow, his Gandiva bow. And then Arjuna has had this vow, right? Because whoever insults my bow, I have to kill them. So he's like, "I better kill my brother." And then Krishna's <laughs> like, "Oh my God, what are we gonna do?" And then in that conversation, Krishna makes clear. He says, "Look." Look, calm down, guys, right? He says, Shastra is authority, yes, but not everything is Shastra. The nature of Dharma cannot be found in Shastra alone, right? There's so many situations. What does the, what does Shastra say about AI? Yeah, great question. <laughs> right? I mean, can you find the chapter and verse? What the look, that's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek sort of thing, but like you get where I'm coming from, is that the, it's a guide, it's it's a supplementary authority, uh, um, something that nourishes the rasa. Um, of what you're experiencing, and yeah, it, it should it it grounds your whole path, right? And that's what's really important. That's the that's the positive side of the coin. But then I think when we talk about sampradaya and siddhanta, especially siddhanta, because siddhanta by definition is perfect conclusion. Um, it, it also does often two things, and which I think we've both observed in the the general version of a landscape. It boxes God and the transcendent into limited concepts and limited theories, and so I mean. I often like to point this out. I mean, two of the names given to Narayana, to the Lord, are uh, Achintya and Adokshaja. So we use Achintya in philosophical terms, but it's also just the name of the Lord, mm. which means inconceivable. And Adokshaja means he who is not reduced. I to mean, the senses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I point to these because it's like sometimes I feel like we lose track of the fact that no matter how intelligent we are, 
no matter how well read we are, we are still dealing on a level, on a platform in terms of intellect, knowledge, senses, information, words that limit something which cannot be limited, describe something which cannot be understood and, 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 and perceived by the material senses. And so it's always just an approximation. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that because it helps us get to the real thing. It's a bridge towards the real thing. But sometimes people lose track of the fact that the approximation does not equate to the actual thing. So the actual thing is far more mystical yeah. than most Vaishnavas are willing to concede because there is a an allergy to the to the idea of mysticism within yeah. Vaishnavism. Because yeah, yeah, dangerous. Abs- yogis, mystics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, because it comes across as... Um, speculation and it's all just me- like psychedelics <laughs> yeah yeah and look there's a part of me that wants to empathize and I get it I get it because as minute you go to the to the domain of mysticism you've basically said anything goes yeah, right? yeah and yeah. that's the fear fear right? big fear yeah and I'm not sort of taking that away from them I think it's a legitimate concern but if you go too far the opposite direction as well you strip away everything that makes the divine divine. Yeah. You strip away everything that makes the transcendent transcendent and you make it material and imminent. Yeah. Vaikuntha is perfectly described. Goloka is perfectly described. Krishna's form is perfectly described. Yeah. Everything is fully accessible to our material limited senses. Mm. So wait a minute. Our limited perception of things, which Shastra clearly points out as being limited, is now able to fully capture the transcendent absolute reality without limits, without like, it's inconceivable by definition. Yeah something's not adding up there no and, and it's this this anxiety which yeah. drives people to this nonsense yeah but one christian preacher he said very aptly he kind of said like knowledge and debate you know polemic debate because obviously yeah. he was a you know he's a real evangelical christian he said is apologetics to, yeah it, yeah is to clear the foliage so that the sun can come through right that's the purpose of siddhanta clear the foliage of the trees and the branches so the sun can burst through so that Krishna can come through on his terms, right? And Guruji made this really um, important thing on the Shandila Bhakti Sutras. He was saying that you have to trust your feelings. You have to trust life if you want to explore bhakti, right? Now, if you're constantly going, okay, this is the first stage of bhakti, and I read the chapter and verse, and this Acharya says this, and then once I've done this, it's, like, it's, like, it's almost like a game. Level one, I've completed yeah, the game. Yeah. Now I'm ready for the passcode. I've got to pass to level two of bhakti, right? And I can go to level two. And suddenly, oh, here are the symptoms of level two. So what I'm experiencing now, check notes, um, is, is, is the, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. So I'm going to discard that feeling. That's completely wrong. If you go down this route, you're, I don't, my personal belief is you're never going to find Krishna in this way, right? We have to eventually learn to trust our feelings, to trust life, because God is the great unknown, as you just said, he's a chintya. And we have to be willing to dive into the fire of bliss, as Guruji puts it, into the sacrifice of bliss of, of the Lord himself, of the Guru, right? And then, Sarva Dharma yeah, we have yeah. to abandon everything, right? I, I had a funny conversation with Guruji once where I was mapping out a problem to him because I was giving a lecture and then I sort of arrived at this conclusion and he was laughing with me and having, it was a nice exchange. But basically it was about this. I said to him, it, it often appears to me, Guruji, like we're in a, a tug of war with God or Guru, right? Where it's like, if you just show me some proof, some evidence, I'll surrender. And God's saying, well, if you just surrender, I'll give you some evidence, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And so it's like, who's going to budge first? It's like this sort of game of, of don't blink. Yeah, whoever yeah. blinks first loses. And then Guruji sort of, he said, yeah, it is like that. But then he laughed and he said, and you really think God's going to give in first? Which one of you two is more patient? Who's got more time to kill, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And so his point was always this. At some point, you're going to have to, whether it's at this point or that point, it doesn't matter. You'll always reach a point where your understanding has reached its limitation and you're going to have to trust in something you don't understand. Be- yeah. Give yourself over to something you don't know. Look, if you, look, it's my opinion that if you really want Krishna you're just going to have to trust. You're just going to have to, and you have to gamble. You have to take an adventure. You're going to have to. And you know what? Look, when you first met Guruji, what would it, um, myself, yeah. I thought stupid things. I was, I was sure. ungrounded. I was, I had so many fantastical ideas about realization and nonsense. And, and, and I trusted them. And I hit a brick wall. And that brick wall was? Paramahamsa Sri Swami Vishwananda, right? Sure. And this is the thing. I hit a brick wall. Then I went another way, hit another brick wall. And gradually, 10 years on, you grow. That's the whole point. You grow in your feelings and you learn to trust. Your adhikara it gets more and more evolved, yeah. right? And you can trust your feelings. And then you start to realize, no, this is God. This is divine. This is real, 
right? You don't get distracted. It takes time. And we need to understand one thing. Life is messy. The spiritual path is messy. And this is another illusion of Sampradaya, right? Is that we think when we have a Siddhanta, we're somehow, we're somehow, oh yeah, it's just a highway to, 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 to Vaikuntha straight away. Like and I, I was saying to you before, there was this uh, Acharya who just said, it's very, very simple. You just, you know, you read the, you read the, the text, the Shastra, you understand the Shastra from a, a, a spiritual master. You, you do the sadhana, you do your chanting, your puja, whatever it is. And then you move from this stage of bhakti to this stage of bhakti. And suddenly you are doing eternal servitude in uh, Vaikuntha. It's like, oh, wow. That's a formula. That's, that's amazing. You know, sign me up, right? And then when you actually walk the path, you realize there's suffering, there's doubts, there's all kinds of stuff. I was going to say, to use your example of a video game, that's like playing a video game with no opponents. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. every level there's no boss at the end of the level I just get to complete the level it's like alright then Yeah, it's not how it goes the, the boss at the end of each level is your anarthas your issues that are inside of there since lifetimes and then you're just going to go well I'll just go check the solution in Shastra and everything's going to naturally go away who has ever had that experience maybe once or twice but who really has deep issues inside of themselves right arrogance, ego, selfishness whatever it may be and then they just go and read a verse from Shastra that explains why you shouldn't have that yeah. and then you go well, it's, it's magically disappeared. Yeah, yeah. And I've often said this for like I, I'm, I'm giving lectures, and I turn to the to devotees, and I say, "Who here wants to be humble?" And everyone raises their hand, and I'm like, "Has that now instantly made you humble?" Yeah. Oh no. Oh, so between wanting it and knowing that you should have it, knowing that it's yeah. the an ideal quality to have, and then actually having yeah. it is a huge gap. So, like, this is a really obvious point. But it gets again, it gets overlooked <laughs> yes. because we get so so the momentum of tradition of shastra. This yes, shastra says this, and tradition says this, and we just follow this formula. And so it doesn't work like that. And I use the example of Krishna. Right, Krishna comes into the, the house of the Gopis. What does he do? He breaks the pots. He urinates everywhere. And as a kid, right, he creates mayhem. That is where the magic of spirituality happens. Right, in the chaos, in the destruction, in the you're building up ideas and it all falls apart, and then suddenly you realize where is Krishna? That yearning, that longing, that desire, that is what is where the, where the revelation happens. Right, Shastra is there to nourish that. Right, and it's not there to conquer that. You know, there was this uh, example of Guruji gave um, a, de- a deity to a. a, a um, uh, a Krishna devotee, right? And, and it was just it was just Krishna playing the flute, and she and she, and she was like, "But I, I can't worship with Krishna." Oh, and, and then someone asked, "What? Why not?" Because because this Radha Radharani is not there. And it's like, okay, Shastra says Radharani, you have to get the mercy of Radharani before you can worship Krishna. It's like, okay, right. So if Krishna comes and appears to you as Bhagavan, Svayam Bhagavan, and he comes there, and and then and then you say, oh, "I can't worship you," <laughs> because I mean, is Radha next to you? Yeah. Right, and this is where the this it's just obviously again another hyperbolic example, but yeah. you get where I'm coming from. I absolutely get where you're coming from, and I think it goes even further than that. Sometimes we're taking the exact same personality and we're breaking his life down into leelas and saying this leela is acceptable, this one's not. Where it's like, sorry, Krishna, if you come to me at a specific age, I have to refuse you. But if you come to me at another age, then green light. Yeah, this is yeah. it. Surrender's coming your way. I'm about to surrender to you. Yeah, and and I just think it's it's. It, it's actually fundamentally so flawed because you're, t- you're talking about tattva, you're talking about the Supreme Lord. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that he's the Supreme Lord. He doesn't say only at specific times of my life I'm the Supreme Lord and you should worship me. Yeah. Now, I, again, don't take this the wrong way. I fully understand that one may have a preference. Hanuman is not going to accept Krishna because he's busy worshipping Rama. Yeah. Right? It's not refusal of Krishna. It's acceptance of Rama, like preference of Rama, yeah, so yeah. to speak. Right. And I think... Bhava therefore has its space and, and has its uh, sort of appropriateness. There's not a problem with that. But it's when it becomes fanatical to the point of saying, because my Bhava is directed towards this part of Krishna Leela, all other parts of Krishna Leela are inferior. Yeah. Cannot yeah. give what this one gives. That's for me completely wrong. And that's not what Guruji says at no, all. Not at all. I mean, he puts some, I mean, he, he'll go and, you know, the appearance there of Nishingadev and he'll be like, Prahlad Narsingha, they're the highest, they're the absolute highest. And then he'll go and Krishna Jamashtam and say, Krishna is the highest, Gopi Bhav is the highest. And he'll go into... Shivaratri. Sh- Shiva, <laughs> Shiva, greatest devotee. Greatest devotee. And, you know, Ram, he's this, and so on. Every occasion is the highest, right? And that's the way Guruji looks at it. When you enter Vaikuntha, everything is the highest, 
right? There's no this, 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 this idea of hierarchy. This one's the original. This one's not the original. This one's sort of the same, but because the rasa is like this, it's higher. This is, this is not Guruji. And he said one time in the Satsang, I have a relationship with the whole, with the fullness. So when people, when people ask him questions like, but Guruji, who is actually higher? He doesn't like these questions, right? Because love is love. Right, God is love. God is love. God is bliss. God is ananda. Right, and once once you attain that state of Bhagavan realization, there's no question of well, hierarchies. I, I, th I think the only the only place where hierarchy belongs is in tattva, and and there he has made the claim. Vishnu tattva yeah, is the highest. Yeah, this, yeah, as Vaishnavas, yeah, yeah. I'll put think, that caveat. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's an important point. Like, as, and I think we 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 should maintain that that yeah. hierarchy. This is tattva. our tradition. This is what Guruji has laid down our path. Right. Yeah. Um, we ha we have a reverence and respect for other people on their path and and so on. We're not interested in, you know, going up and tapping people on the shoulder and saying, by the way, oh, you're worshiping Shiva, you know, we pity you and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. That is not our way. Our path. Everyone needs a direction. Everyone needs a purpose, and we have Guruji, and our faith is in conviction is in Guruji, and this is the Vaishnava path, Vishnu Tattva form is, is for us to have. And I think I think that that's also one of the unique unique elements of the Hari Bhakta Sampradaya that we do establish a Tattva hierarchy. Vishnu Tattva is at the topmost position, but once we're there, we we say no more hierarchy. So within the Tattva itself, no hierarchy between the forms of Vishnu Tattva, no yeah. hierarchies between the Bhavas towards Vishnu Tattva, because. And I think this is the, the the crux of it, so people understand it properly. The reason we don't create those hierarchies is because we don't want to limit God. The, we, if we we take the Lord as, as being absolute and, and we mean it, yeah. which means that we can't at, at any point say, this Lord is incapable. Yeah. That sentence, the minute it leaves our mouth, the minute we think it, Rama is incapable. Yeah. Nishingadev is incapable. We are limiting a tattva from our position, which is nonsense. It's just something we don't want to do and we don't accept. Or even that the rasa is even less. Yes, that, yes. In that, no. So what, what we're basically saying is that f the full potentiality of the fullness of the Lord is present in all of Vishnu. In, rela in relationship and power and ability. Yes, yeah, yes. The whole thing. Yeah. And so we look at also Vaikuntha, the supreme abode, as being... Um, an abode of infinite chambers. And those chambers provide different rasas, different forms, different ways of interacting with the Lord, but never in a hierarchical situation. Yeah. It's not Goloka's above Vaikuntha or Vaikuntha's above Goloka. Yeah, yeah. We don't make either claim. We say that there is a Vaikuntha abode and in that abode, um, the chamber of Goloka exists. Yeah, yeah. And again, like people will say, what, well, where, where's, where, where's your Shastric authority for that, right? Again, because again, as soon as you go down these routes of discussion, someone, you know, who, who's maybe from a Vaishnava Sampradaya may just look at it and go, yeah, but where's your authority for that? Are you just, is it just DIY spirituality? And again, let me go, let, we need to remind people, up to Vakya, right? That the statements of the greats, of the great masters, we consider Guruji a great master based on our direct experience with him, right? To complete this game also, where's the Shastric evidence for Radha? Yeah, <laughs> writings of acharyas of a, of a system that already believes in Radha. Yeah, I, I, even if we say okay, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he really brought the worship of Radha forward. Okay, cool. So, what's the difference? Yeah, it, it, it's a transcendent personality. You believe him; he's God, and we're even happy to go along yeah. with that belief. Emerges from folk tradition. Yeah, Gita Govinda and so on. Yeah. So you know, we, can, we this game can be played in every single direction, and this idea of where's the shastric evidence for this? Where's the shastric evidence for Madhvacharya's position that souls go to hell forever? Yeah. Or that the world is unreal. Yeah. The, the thing is this, look, Shankaracharya, what does he do? He picks the Mahavakas, focus on the Shruti, right? And he puts the other, the, the kind of dualistic um, verses of the Shastra as, as subordinate. That's what he does. That's, yeah. that's the way he's playing it based on his bhava. Ramanuja Acharya marries the non-dualistic and dualistic ones together. He focuses on the Brihadaranyaraka um, verse that Andariyami, the Lord is the indweller of everything. So he picks that verse and he reconciles all other verses uh, with that, right? And then he marries with the Divya Prabandham and the Pancharatra Agama. You have Madhvacharya. I mean, there's many sources that Madhvacharya quotes that we don't know about, right? I mean, scholars are sometimes baffled by some of the references that he puts forward. Um, and he even says uh, Bhagavatam has interpolations in it, right? And that, that, that is Later a, editions, basically. Later yeah. editions, yeah. Um, inserted verses. And then you have um, Jiva Goswami. And, and Jiva Goswami is very free, very, very free. He quotes from Shankaracharya when he needs to, um, Sri Vaishnavas when, when he needs to, um, Madhvacharya's sources. Rajasak and Tamasak Puranas. Yep. Uh, Skanda Purana's in there, and then you know, Sri Swami is, is also um, in, is considered sometimes a little bit impersonalistic in his commentary in the Bhagavatam. And so like that, he's very free 
to pick and choose. He has this term like the Paribhasa Sutra, like a Krishna to Bhagavan Svayam. And yeah. from that, he reconciles everything. Everything yeah. has to conform to Krishna being the original form of God. Um, and then you have the Brahman Paramatma Bhagavan. Again, everybody else skips past that verse. It's just, yeah, it's just Brahman Paramatma Bhagavan. It's yeah, the Sri Vaishnavas don't make any point of this. Right, but Sri Vigoswami, he stops, Paul hits the brakes hard on that and then says, right, let me write, you know, four or five books on that, right? Yeah. And so, and he creates a whole Siddhanta. Yeah. So what is actually happening? As we said, as we said before, it's, I want everyone, if we can, to really take this home. Acharyas who have experienced the truth in some way, who have received a bhava and rasa, a revelation in their heart, are then creating a siddhanta, that means principles that, that govern their rasa, and then grounding it in the shastra, right? That is the purpose of what is happening here in Sampradaya. And then someone might say, because we have this distinction between Panta and Sampradaya. Upper Sampradaya also, they, they really, there's a lot of terms thrown around. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So Panta means a saint, like a master. And a Panta movement, like Shirdi Sai Baba, for example. Kabir. Yeah. Was, yeah, these are kind of Panta movements where, you know, the personality is the authority, not the Shastra, yeah. right? And maybe they use Shastra here and there, but they're picking and choosing what they like, right? And there's uh, usually not a Brampa either. Yeah. Um, and then you have Sampradaya, which is Shastra is the authority, right? Very, very author um, orthodox and um, based, based in the scriptural revelation. And they're seen as being the intention between each other. Panta on one side, Sampradaya on the other. But the reality is there isn't really the tension that people think it is. Because as we said, it's the Acharya who has the revelation um, and then reads it and grounds it into scripture, into its shastra. I mean, uh, from my experience, a panta often is, uh, or like a saint mat, is usually just um, a sampradaya that not enough time has passed yet, or not enough, <laughs> not enough adherents have joined. Because yeah. eventually will be, like Ramanandi sampradaya, for yeah. example, right? Um, is nowadays recognized as a legitimate offshoot of the Sri Sampradaya. Yeah, yeah. But it is its own sampradaya. That's why it's called the Ramanandi sampradaya. Yeah. Or they would just say we're Sri sampradaya, right? Yeah. Um, but again, it's just one individual sort of has his own sort of unique takes and first it's seen more as an offshoot cultish sort of thing. And then eventually it's like, oh, actually it seems like it's lasted long enough, enough followers. This is a legitimate Sampradaya. Like, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had Jiva Goswami, Rupa Goswami, Goswami's not written their works. Yeah. Just said they didn't do it. It would become a punter movement. It would be hundred percent, hundred percent. It'd be like, you know, this great personality who, you know, brought Harinam and the love of Krishna Prem to, to the world. And it would just it would be a punter sit movement, but because of the of Goswamis and their great work, you have the Goldi Sampradaya and a systemized Siddhanta that follows. And so, but the, it still doesn't change the dynamic. It comes from the personality. I fully agree. I actually think that the difference between the two is is illusory. There's a, the other the other term I mentioned, the upper Sampradaya, is a is a claim often sort of or an accusation, sort of um, thrown at people outside of the the four bona fide Sampradayas. And it's the idea that you claim to be of a sampradaya, but you don't actually follow it properly. You don't follow it rigor rigorously. And so the issue I have with this is that, and maybe we can touch upon that. What do you think about the idea that there are four bona fide sampradayas to begin with? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, sorry, I have to laugh a little bit on that because... Tell look, me why, Myron. No, no, Tell look, me why. Look, look let, me not, let me not laugh. Let me be a bit <laughs> serious here. But like... I, I would say it gets thrown around a lot. And again, I could, let me reiterate the phrase, momentum of tradition, yeah. right? When you say something once, you know, they call it a nudge unit in a, the media can do it. If you say a truth, say, say a statement and everyone just keeps repeating it, suddenly it becomes absolute law and fact. And it's like, who, but has anyone verified this fact? Um, it doesn't matter. It's just accepted. You just have to accept it because everyone's saying it is and everyone's talking about it and it's written in the newspapers and everything else. It must be truth. So this is what this is falling into that category. So I've I've looked at I've spoken to different scholars. I mean, obviously I'm a dentist. I'm not a scholar, but um, I've spoken to different scholars, and none of them can trace this. And often is that there is a Padma Purana reference, right? It talks about you know these four acharyas will come, and you know any mantra has to come through these four acharyas, implying that there's only four sampradayas where you can get legitimate diksha initiation and mantra. Um, almost like a prophecy, right? Yeah. Um, and strangely, often well, it is a prophecy because if it's in if it's in the Purana, Padma Purana, yeah. Padma Purana was written before the emergence of these sampradayas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Full on prophecy. Yeah. So, and what's strange is this this verse. There's no reference to it. Oft, often, you, if you Google it, just do a you know anyone can just casually Google it, and you'll you'll find that there's there's no actual reference. 
Um, and so, okay, and then it's, I think in some there is a reference, right? But there's, but then when you when people dig in the Padma Purana, they, they can't find it, yeah. right? In the manuscripts, there's no, it's not there. So it seems to be very much uh, a later addition, an interpolation into the Padma Purana. And I, and then from my understanding, from talking to different scholars, it comes in from the 16th century. Um, and then it gets perpetuated into the Gaga Samhita is another kind of text that, that, that's there. But it's basically saying there's only four Sampradayas and if you're not part of these four Sampradayas, you are illegitimate and, you know, you, you're you just going rogue. And talking about later editions, I, I, I have to mention this and obviously I don't do it with any intent of disrespect, but just to point out the same inconsistency when we talk about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Gaudi Sampradaya, and you say, okay, well, that's pretty much what's going on with our movement. It's just a transcendent individual who has seen the truth, giving his philosophy, giving his teaching, people are following. Um, they say, no, 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 he was prophesized in Shastra. It's all over Shastra. And you can you can find websites these days that have sort of collated all the references. There's Chaitanya. hundreds of references, yeah. yeah. Apparently there's hundreds of references. That everyone else has missed. To Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and everybody else has missed these references. Yeah. And not only have they missed them, but even after being shown them mercifully by the devotees of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they have gone to inspect and still haven't accepted or agreed with them. Yeah. Now, I have two big issues with this. First, how can you, as a follower of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, see here that all these other sampradayas are rejecting the existence of these verses or the authority of them and still say, but they are bona fide. <laughs> Those people there, they know what they're doing. They're legitimate. Yeah. Even though they've said, you're not legitimate, basically. And second, why have they all missed this? I mean, great, great Shastric scholars in all of the Sampradayas who have scrutinized Shastra to the nth degree in order to prove philosophy, to prove Vaishnavism's existence, etc., etc. And not only have they not seen anything that points towards Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's incarnation, they also haven't accepted things like Bhagavatam as Supreme Pramana, which Chaitanya yeah. says, and, and many, many different points that then are part of the Gaudiya Sampradaya. And this isn't for me to say, therefore, the Gaudiya Sampradaya is illegitimate. No, not at all. It's why can't we all just be honest as to why it's legitimate? It's legitimate because there was a legitimate personality at the top of it making claims. An incarnation. And, and living, an incarnation. Avatar. And, yeah. and the people around him recognized that in him and therefore gave their faith and surrendered to that. And that has now developed into what is now known as the Gaudiya Sampradaya. And the same thing is applied in all other instances, pretty much. Yeah. And that's it. And and you when you start to to just be honest about this, I mean, I'll now bridge into the next thing that I would like to call out. The idea that these four sampradayas, having already established that this is pretty much a false claim, come from four de de originating deities. Yes, okay, maybe, maybe. Again, I'm never going to outright deny this as an impossibility. But it's such a tenuous link. It's so difficult to sit here and say, yes, we can legitimately trace the yeah. teachings of this philosophy back to Mahalakshmi in Vaikuntha. Well, we can do that, but we don't know if your Guruji has Guru's, Guru's been initiated into the Sri Sampradaya. Yeah, that, yeah that's, we, that that's we dubious. Doubt. That's dubious. But the deity, founding deity, that's that's absolutely certain. That is that is absolutely certain. And and let's let me point out a couple of things there that, that sort of make me laugh. So Narada Muni initiates Nimbarka Acharya, so Nimbarka Sampradaya, one of the four Sampradayas. So he's in the parampara of the Nimbarka Sampradaya, transmitting mm. philosophy to Nimbarka Acharya, who yeah. then codifies it. He's also in the Madhva Sampradaya Parampara as well. So a different philosophy. He's in a different mood. Narada's in a different mood and <laughs> teaches a complete different tattva that ends up in Madhva Acharya. Yeah. But again, when you take Nimbarka and you take Madhva and you see their, their philosophies, they are very, very different. Yeah, yeah. Right. But they both have Narada in their Parampara. Yeah. And so it's like, again, really? Really? Is that what we're doing? Again, it just feels like we're, we're taking these names that are universally accepted as being authoritative, Veda Vyas, Narada, the four founding deities. And we, we bind ourselves to them because we want credibility in, a, in an ocean of skepticism, in an ocean of people saying, but why do you have the truth? You just yeah. go, well, because Veda Vyas, yeah. because Narada, because Mahalakshmi, because Brahma. Yeah. But it's really just borrowed authority. And when you scrutinize it, the only reason anyone's ever believed in this is because other people are saying it too, like you said. Yeah, so basically what's happening now is one, look, we've just gone through a lot of stuff here at quite quick pace. Yeah. And um, people, what, what happens is when you feed into these narratives over and over and over again, you go to your Sunday class, you're, you're a sangha and so on, you're constantly being, reading the books and so on, you create, what you create is a lot of hot air, smoke and mirrors, right? And, and that's the problem. People are not being able to just think clearly about what is actually true 
What is actually true? What do you actually know for sure, right? And then, and what is the purpose of Sampradaya? To connect you to God. Yeah. Come back to the basics. What do you actually know and what is the purpose of Sampradaya? This, all this stuff that we've been talking about is a lot of hot air. And I think, like, the antagonism and the tension between Sampradayas, right, is something that comes about because of this hot air. Because we've forgotten the very basis of what's going on. Well, we fight on the periphery. If you look at Sampradayas as the core, i.e. Vishnu Tattva Supreme, and that actually all the Vaishnava Sampradayas agree on. Yeah. There's full agreement. Yeah. Whether Narayana is original or Krishna is original or something else, that's up to debate. But yeah. that Vishnu Tattva is supreme, everybody agrees. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's what makes you a Vaishnava. Yeah. Um, but on the periphery, we have things like your tilak design, the <laughs> mantras you recite during puja, yeah. how you dress, yeah. which deity you put on the main altar accompanying Vishnu Tattva, et cetera, et cetera. Are you and, wearing upper garment? <laughs> I'm already a heretical that's, Vaishnava. That's Aparad. Well, sorry. I'm in Germany. It's cold. <laughs> um, and that's and that's somehow the issue here, right? We, we we take the peripheral issues that actually have no ultimate meaning, no, no ultimate consequence rather, to the realization or not of Krishna. Krishna says in, in Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti Mama Bijanati, it's only by Bhakti yeah. that you actually get to know me. Yeah. I don't think our Bhakti is measured by the shape of our tilak nor by the clothes that we're wearing. Yeah, and if and if someone wants to make the claim that it is, that's a really materialistic and limiting and and, and cheap conception yeah. of bhakti. So yeah, you've you've talked about those peripheral issues, but then w- I was discussing with this um, another Sri Vaishnava, and he and he was uh, kind of saying, you know, posing some questions, you know, so pointing the finger a little bit. At, you yeah. know, you're starting Hari Bhakti Sampradaya and this, that, and the other. And all I said to him is, can you empirically prove your faith is true? Your tradition is true. Yeah. Can you empirically, that means objectively, using evidence, prove that your tradition is, is true? Yeah. And when I pressed him on this, he, you know, after uh, he asked, oh, but Shastras, I said, okay, but why, why this, uh, Shastras, this whole debate where we just went through, I went yeah. through with yeah. him, why this text, why that text, blah, blah, blah. And then he basically just said, well, not really, I can't. So I, then I said to him, if you cannot empirically prove your own tradition to yourself, how can you disprove empirically my tradition? Right. And it's just a madness. It's an absolute madness that's crept into the situation. People are coming over and saying, oh, are you legitimate? Are you legitimate? And it's like, well... Sh- show me your parampara. Show me your parampara. Yeah. We've got a parampara that goes to Mahalakshmi or to, or to Lord Brahma. <laughs> oh, really? Really? So you've got the evidence for that, apart from just people just saying it. Yeah. Right? You cannot empirically prove. So why on earth do people, what is the legitimacy of a sampradaya? And this, this sounds really weak to some people, but for us it's amazing yeah. and, it's, and it's really tangible because of what Guruji has shown us is that heartfelt connection. Right? Why does somebody join a sampradaya? Is it because they've analysed the prastana traya of Shankaracharya and all the four Vaishnava sampradayas and they've said, you know what? After careful analysis... This one's the most coherent. Yeah, Madhva's got it right. Yeah, he's got it right out of everybody. So I'm going to join this sampradaya. No, you join a sampradaya because you meet devotees, because you hear the kirtan, because you have a darshan of a deity, because some coincidence happens, because something strikes at your heart. And because of that, that connection, that is your entry point into the sampradaya. And from there, the philosophy, and unfortunately, sometimes the smoke and mirrors builds from there. Yeah. And I think it, it, people often convince themselves that they have more faith than they really do because they've read all of this. They, they're sort of exposed to the philosophy of the Sampradaya and they think, well, this must be true because all these other people are following it. So I'm just going to project this out onto my reality. And so, okay, guru is like God. So are you the guru of this Sampradaya? Then you're like God. And yeah. you just sort of start yeah. attributing all these titles and, and roles to people. And, and really they never sit and, and think about it more deeply. Yeah. And it, look, it comes down to the fact, look, you can have faith in the tradition, no problem. But what do you want me to do? I've met a personality that when I pray, he answers my prayers. He shows that he shows his omniscience. He's someone who can crush my ego. I've seen him a master of consciousness, delivering messages to me in dreams. You know, um, someone I've mapped out my life for 16, 17 years, and he's orchestrated my whole life innumerable coincidences, innumerable unexplainable and inexplicable events happening all the time, right? And that's just what I can just articulate on a microphone, right? Yeah. The, the inner conviction of what I feel is something in, an, in a whole other realm with, with Guruji. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to just brush that aside and go, I've got to find some commentary from some like 15th century text and you know, that's the one that's going to define my life? 
Of course I'm not going to do that. I'd be mad. I'd be insane yeah. if I would do that. That, 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 that. that first-hand experience and conviction of the apta, of the guru, of the satguru, of the great acharya, who has seen tattva darshana, yeah. that has to be the defining point of sampradaya, of, a spirit, of any spiritual path. Actually, Guruji said something interesting um, yesterday. He said, bhakti is a madness. You do become mad in bhakti, but it's grounded in something concrete and real. It's not a madness grounded in sort of illusion and hopeful, wishful thinking. It's so you've had a real experience, as you just pointed out. I've had an experience. Here's my real, concrete life experiences that I've had now, not once, not twice, but over a sustained many years. period of time, reproducible in other situations. Yeah. Because of this, I can dive fully into this, give myself to this, surrender to this in a mad sort of way, to the conventional sort of way of seeing life. But it's not. Um, it's not rooted in the hope that what you read in a 15th century text is going to manifest once you've performed this surrender. Yeah. It's actually like, no, my, my, my life experiences are fueling my surrender. They're fueling my devotion. They're fueling my yeah. quote unquote madness. Look, like, Guruji mentioned this point and again in the, in the Shandila Sutras where he said, look, you have to trust your feelings yeah. Yeah. and you have to trust life because that is where God is. And if, if you if you're unable to, look, and look if you don't trust your feelings, fair enough, right? Um, you could Shastra is there as 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 a as a kind of a supplementary, a guide, and so on. But God is found in your feelings, and you know this comes down to um, Vivekananda, right? Mm. What, what, he went and asked him a simple question: Have you seen God? Before he met Ramakrishna, he went right. to so many sadhus, so many great acharyas. They're all there on their big scriptures, on their Vyasa Asan, whatever it is, and they're preaching. And he's asking him, have you seen God? And they're all going, yeah, but you know, the Shastra said, no, no, no. Have you seen God? Right? Have you had the Tattva Darshana? Right? And then he goes to Ramakrishna. Have you seen God? Yes, I see him more clearly than I see you now. And then he touches him with his foot and his whole world disappears. What do you want, what do you want Vivekananda to do? Oh, you know what? I'm going to go to this commentary here. That, that experience doesn't conform to chapter and verse. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, look, there is a beauty in following a parampara chain and walking in the footsteps of great personalities who have, you know, like Ramanuja Acharya or whatever, the parampara chain. There is a wonderful beauty in accessing a guru there. But there's another situation which for me personally appeals to me, which is I need to know that this personality knows God. Not just knows God, can give God. And for me, and I, I, I said this on Guruji's birthday, is that I don't believe Guruji can just give God. Like if you ask me for, for like some 10 euros, I'll have to like fish my pockets and I can maybe find, yeah, I've got it, yeah, 10 euros. I don't think Guruji's in that situation. I think Guruji is like a dam holding back a tsunami. And the reason why he's holding it back is because we're too stupid, we're too foolish, and we don't want it enough. I think it's more that last point. Yeah. I, I'd put the emphasis there. We don't want it enough where we're too attached to everything that's not behind that, that dam. We're yeah. Not, and, and that's what it is. I think at the crux of it, it comes down to we're that. We're still choosing other things too yeah. much. Yeah. And when I think as soon as Guruji sees that, you know, that, that longing, that pure, absolute one-pointed longing that, you know, you just, you, you cannot imagine anything else. Na anya bhakti, nothing, no other refuge, right? He will just relax. What, <laughs> and, and the torrent of Krishna will come no, forth. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But what would you say, because people will listen to this and obviously, if, you know, somebody who's not a follower of Guruji, if they listen to this, they're going to say, okay, so you have this, this personality who you're making all these sort of claims about. Um, what's your evidence for this? Right? Like, wh how, <clears throat> what makes Guruji unique? What makes his claim unique, his sampradaya unique, what makes him reliable? Like what, what's, how would you go about that? So we, none of us are coming to Guruji with um, tremendous amounts of Shastric knowledge, by and large. By and large. By and large, right? Um, when we first met Guruji, mm -hmm. that, that has obviously developed since meeting Guruji, right. but like um, in the first meeting him. So when I first met Guruji, I was looking for this, right? Has this person seen God? Yeah. Has this person seen God? Um, and when I first met him, he gave me all kinds of answers. And I've said this in, on YouTube and so on, is that he was saying stuff philosophically that was totally incoherent, right? Illogical, irrational, didn't make any sense. I completely lost all trust in him in my first meeting, right? 
<laughs> and and I was just and like never gained it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I never had any trust, and I lost yeah. all possible trust yeah. in that meeting. And I and 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 uh, he was just laughing, having a great time. He was having a great time at my expense, and I was going, I was getting so frustrated with him. And I took a vow. I said, I'm never coming back here again. Two weeks later, I was back again. The reason is. The, I could not forget that first initial meeting. As soon as he walked down those stairs, that person, I looked at him and immediately it was like this overwhelming rush of, I absolutely know you, right? And it, I, I kind of liken it to an example. Imagine like my, if I see my wife somewhere and I just go up to her and I say, oh, that familiarity, but you'd never met them before. You just, it just kind of understand, like gives you some understanding. Like you have absolutely know this person. Like you feel like you can just go out to him and give him a hug or whatever. And you're like, but it's the first time I'm ever meeting him. And but my mind, which was searching for the shastric kind of uh, conformity, the box ticking exercise, was suppressing that feeling. And I was kept asking him aggressively, asking him, what is the situation? What is the situation? Yeah. And it was it was that recognition, that remembrance. Right, that basically evoked that situation inside of me that made me realize this is what my life has been waiting for. It is this is a summation, the climax of my life. And from there, it was a process of didn't just happen in one go, right? It was a process of experience after experience. Like I said, you utter a prayer in your house in London that you a specific prayer, asking him. You go to Germany and then he calls you forward and he whispers in your ear that same prayer and says, Don't worry, it will be fulfilled. Right? You don't tell a soul. And you come, he comes in your dream. He tells you a message. You go and see him in Germany. And he repeats the dream that he said, I came in your dream. I said, this isn't this. These are just external things, yeah. right? That someone who doesn't know Guruji, I can go on and on about this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. As can you. Um, these are just external things to show that he's not an ordinary person, right? Right. He's not just a person who reads, who knows our Shastra and is just is explaining Kata and so on, right? But the inner conviction is something else. That taste is what grows, the taste, the, the faith in the taste and, and the stronger faith that grows bit, day by day, year by year, that is what flowers. But actually, I'd like to just stop you there for a second because in a conviction, you've given the examples of the experiences Guruji has given to you, right? Some people might not have those experiences from Guruji, but still they might have that in a conviction yeah. because the thing is this, and I, and I would like us to, as, a, as one of the major points of today's episode as well, is to make people comfortable in trusting and following those inner convictions. As you said, Guruji was mentioning Shindili Bhakti Sutra commentaries, trust your feelings, trust your life, etc. Look at it from this perspective. Nobody ever makes the most important decisions in their life purely on empirical data. No. It doesn't happen. When you choose your wife or your husband, when you're going to go and propose to them, do you know they're going to say yes or no? Often, no, you don't. Do you, do you know how your future is going to turn out with that person? Or when you have a child with them, do you know how your child is going to grow up and who they're going to grow up to be? None of these things, yet you choose to do it. How, why? Because of feeling, love, for example, or whatever. There's, there's, there's something inside of you that says, this is the person I want to marry. It's not a rational, or not, at least not a purely rational thing. Yeah. Right. Same thing, I would like to have a child. I'd like to raise a child. Do I know exactly what's going to happen? Is it going to be good for me or not? I have no idea, but I have this attraction, attraction this, this feeling that I should do this. And I think they have to. people have to start growing comfortable and doing the exact same thing in the spiritual path, which is, do I fully understand everything about this process? No. Do I know where it's going to take me? No. Do I know every little detail? Will I make mistakes? Sure. Yeah. Sure. And the point is, is what do I actually feel? And ask yourself the question very deeply. What do I feel? What am I, what am I seeing in this individual? And I've got no issue with somebody who comes and meets Guruji and says, I don't feel anything. Yeah. No problem at all. The same way we said we don't have a problem with somebody who's worshipping Shiva. And we're not going to go over to them and tell them, you have to start worshipping Narayana now. Yeah. Because everyone's got their path. And also, look, you could come to Guruji and become com completely ungrounded, right? It happens. Well, because we have responsibility. Right, yeah. We're co-responsible in this. And this is another thing as well. That's a good point you mentioned. I don't want to judge Mahaprabhu on the behavior of oh, everyone who claims to follow Mahaprabhu. Yeah. Right? At the same time, I also would like to judge everyone, Mahaprabhu, based on everyone who follows him. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a paradox. But it's like, yes, the quality of the tree is partially determined by the fruits. But at the same time, if one fruit is rotten, it doesn't mean the whole tree is rotten. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a bird came and picked at it and, you know, yeah. it, some some external factor, right? And so I think it's just about, in general, going away from absolutes of black and white, this or that. Yeah. And we have to be more nuanced about everything. Yeah. Everything. This was, I mean, this I think is an overarching theme of today's discussion in general, to be more nuanced, to be more honest and dig deeper. But I think especially in this question of faith, 
How do you know your guru is the legit one? Meet him, experience him, live, try, exp- and have, fa- yeah. have faith in what you're feeling, what you're receiving. See where it takes you. Yeah. 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 Because life is an adventure. Life is, an a, jour- is a journey. And we just, we, the, the formula, the rigid formula, structural formula of this and this and this and then Shastra says this and so on. Look, it's there. Keep it there on the table. I'm not saying throw it to white. Keep it there on the table. But also understand life is an adventure. And this is another point. It just came to my mind as well, is that sometimes people in the Vaishnava world think that if a being is truly divine or an incarnation, avatar, it's going to be just obvious to everyone. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Shankar, um, chunk and chakra everywhere. No. Like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, right? Allegedly born with all the symbols under his feet. Right? According to? Shastra. Which is written by? Uh, Purva and, wh- and when? <laughs> okay, fine. Yes. So if you've been listening attentively, you know the answer to all those questions. <laughs> So he's supposedly born with the, the, the marks of Lord Vishnu or Krishna's feet, right? There's symbols that are traditionally depicted. Look, being... let's just, can we just caveat this after these sarcastic comments, right? It, it's not that it's not true, right? It's, no, no. If, you, I, if faith is there of a devotee, fantastic. Yes, we right? are not at all denying the truth of this. We are, we are calling out the mentality of people who approach this topic and deal with this topic yeah. more often than not. So this idea that he was born with all these symbols, right? If it was so easily accessible and available, why would he need to preach to anyone? Just lift his foot and show his foot, give foot darshan to everyone. Like and the Sarva everyone Barma, can, Vata, yeah, when he's yeah. debating and listening to him and stuff. Yeah. And everyone just becomes converted. Um, yeah. The signs are there. Yeah. Where's the doubt? If it's so implicit in Shastra, just show the Shastra and they'll accept because it has the name of his parents. It has the place where he's going to be born. It has everything, yeah. right? And the point I'm making therefore is, is not that the, that the claim is that he's divine is, is bogus, not at all. I'm saying the idea that the Lord should be so easily recognized, yeah. that is bogus because it's not true even for Krishna. Krishna, the Supreme Lord that every Vaishnava yeah. unanimously accepts as being so, was not recognized as being Bhagav- Bhagavan yeah. by everyone around him. Why? Yoga Maya Samavrata, I cover myself. That's with, it. Yeah. He states it himself in Shastra because I cover myself. So why are we holding any future or other incarnation of the Lord to any different standard. Yeah. So if Krishna himself comes and says, I cover myself to the point where practically when we read, so we has, there's the claim from Krishna and then there's the practical analysis of the various leaders that took place with Krishna in the Bhagavatam, etc. And you see proof of that. You see proof of people not recognizing the Supreme Lord in Krishna, right? Indra, the whole Govardhan Lila is that he looks at that boy and says, what's that boy doing there? Who is he? Even Indra doesn't know. Yeah. Let alone just normal human beings going about that. Well, even Arjuna, in right. the, until chapter ten, right. should we say? Right? right. So Arjuna, Indra. I mean, the list goes on of great persons, even Brahma to an extent, who who don't recognize the extent of the divinity. That's an interpolation, though. Oh. oh, okay. oh. So you see, so that's going on, and that standard is now being unfairly applied to any claim made thereafter. So, if, for example, I make the claim Guruji is Narayana, he's an avatar. If I make the claim, yeah. then let me just say, well, where's the evidence? It should be in Shastra. It should be this. It should be that. It should be blatantly yeah. obvious. Yeah. And it's like, well, what Shastra have you been reading? What, what, what avatars have you come across that that's just obvious? In the Shingadev, if he appears out of a pillow with a lion head, yeah, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, yeah. But that's not the only standard of avatar that we've ever dealt with. Yeah, the thing is, look, Samarvata Swarupa, the, 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 the hidden Swarupa of the avatar is there. Right, and it, he Krishna makes it very clear. I don't reveal myself to everybody. There it's is a qualification. It's adhikar. It's, it's adhikar. There's just his mercy. It just needs to drop, right? And it's not just and 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 let's let also make the point. We're not saying everybody in the whole universe, eight billion people, need to bow down to Swami Vishwananda, and that is your path, and that is what you have. No, not at all. A master comes down, an avatar comes down, and they come down for their souls, for the people that are meant to be with them. He gives them the opportunity, yeah. right? Right? And whether we decide to take it or not is there. And maybe that it's not everybody's opportunity. They have a different dharma, a different purpose, a different trajectory of the soul. Right? We fully acknowledge that. We're not making these absolute exclusivist statements. Right? Certainly Guruji would never subscribe to that kind of stuff. I'll certainly make the invitation though. And, Obviously, and, and, yeah. And, yeah. and I do that only because it would be a betrayal to myself not to. Because of everything that he's given me and everything that I've experienced with him, I'd like to think that I'm a, um, a grounded person. And, that, and, I'm, and I work on that specifically. I, I'm, I've, I'm quite allergic to ungroundedness. I don't like it. I never have liked it. I don't appreciate it when I, when I see it elsewhere, whether it's in our path or in any other path. Um, and you meet those people in every tradition, including ours. Um, and I think one of the most powerful things I've ever experienced in my life is when you meet people who are grounded, competent, intelligent, and 
they're able to tell you the truth. And it's a truth that speaks to something you haven't experienced yourself. But it's as much as it's a testimony, it's at the same time an invitation to, would you like to explore? Would you like to to pursue the same experience that I've had? Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that anyone is going to have the same experiences that I've had with Guruji if you do what I've done. Not at all. Because I don't believe that that's it's reproducible in that way. It's not formulaic. The Lord is the Lord. You are a Jiva and your relationship with him is unique. You're not going to have the exact same experiences of someone else, but they're going to be close enough. It's going to be similar enough, I would say. And so whenever I speak about my experiences and, you know, as you have said, we've both done this extensively in other, you know, YouTube videos and satsangs and whatever else. There is something there that I'm, I'm, I often feel if you're, if you're not completely shut off to the possibility, you have to explore it. I mean, there's something inside of you that goes, can I really just dismiss this outright? Yeah. Is it responsible? Is it a, an intelligent thing to do? Is it a rational thing to do to just dismiss this yeah. just because it's not convenient for me or just because it doesn't fit in, in the framework within um, which I'm already in? And I therefore I, I make this this invitation. It's like, it's not, like you said, we're not wanting everybody to convert or become devotees, not at all. But there's something worth exploring here. No, absolutely. Look, I believe God, Guruji is someone who has God to give. Yeah. Now, I just ask you, are you burning inside? Do you want to know God? Do you want to look into the eyes of somebody who knows God? How many people in your life can you say with absolute certainty that they know God. I'm not talking about people who can know scripture or Shastra or good examples or good, great character, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody, a personality who actually knows Krishna, yeah. right? Who can give you that conviction, who knows Krishna. And I'm saying to you, that has got to be the most rarest thing around. And if there is a hypothesis that there is a personality who perhaps falls into that category, I would drop everything to go and see that person. And that's what I did in 2005 yeah, yeah, yeah. for that very reason. I heard these amazing stories and I was like, no, this is wrong. This is, this is all false. This is all just like, this is all just hearsay, ungrounded talk, right? I went there, had my, my doubts confirmed and then came back two weeks later. And now MK got initiated, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Well, I think, I think I'd love to do another episode with you where we dive into that. I think that the exact personality of Guruji and, and yeah. what he is to us and why we think that and, and all of that. And I think we can leave that for another another conversation because I think it's extensive and merits its own sort of build up and set up. Um, but I think I think in terms of the Sampradaya situation, I'm pretty satisfied with what we've what we've achieved here. Yeah, I mean, we could go into lots of scriptural references in detail, but I think you know that might be too deeper dive maybe one day maybe know. one day okay That's fine it. leave these things open but you, i think you might I, need a projector here or something <laughs> like that we're gonna do a, a lecture slash conversation yeah i just i just feel that it's um if anything is taken away from today's conversation from people i think it's to 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 challenge their pre-existing beliefs about sampradaya and about vaishnavism as a landscape and i don't mean it in a in a sort of provocative way but rather in a in an honest way, like with nuance, with honesty, with sort of let's really look at this and, and be honest with our own experiences, our own feelings and what we've observed and, and not just blindly accept things as as being true just because they've been repeated a but, lot. But I tell you, the fire of longing is the thing that does that. When you are... when you are Sincerity. Sincerity, yeah. yeah. When you're on your knees crying for Krishna, you don't care how Krishna comes. You don't care what, what form, you know, how he approaches you. And Krishna you. doesn't care how you come either, as yeah, long as that's, that's, exactly. the tears are sincere. So that is the thing that burns the way and, and to truth, yeah. to the rock, bedrock of truth. Agreed. Good. Happy? Yeah, Good. I'm happy. Yeah. All right. I look forward to our next episode together. Me too. Till next time. Jay Gurdjieff. Jay Gurdjieff.